America's most independent talk show host. Here's Charles Goyette. Good morning. Welcome to our show, 7.07 in the morning. I am Charles Goyette. I don't know if you remember the uh, the era. Uh, if you don't remember, your parents will su- certainly remember the era of the, of the late 1970s, the early 1980s, kind of the economic dislocations that were going on at the time. We had a period uh, in which you could watch the U.S. dollar falling like a stone. It was literally in free fall. There was a period at which the uh, the secret the secret uh, banking operations that really settles accounts between nations in uh, Switzerland, the Bank for International Settlements, said, "You guys, you guys in the United States are going to have to do something serious about the dollar. And if you do not, then we're going to abandon the dollar as a unit of account for the settlement of international affairs as a uh, as a reserve currency for the world." This was in the uh, the late 70s, uh, early 1980s. I don't know if you remember, but uh, you may, double-digit interest rates, the kind of inflation we had during that period. The recession of 1982 was, as I recall, probably the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. It was a real economic roller coaster. It was, it was Mr. Toad's wild ride during that period. And a, uh, a congressman from Texas by the name of Ron Paul was serving on the House Banking Committee. And distinguished himself immediately and, and called himself to the attention of, uh, of people that were really alert and paying attention to what was going on in, uh, in the United States Congress and with the Federal Reserve and about the economic dislocations that the nation was facing. He distinguished himself by speaking about it in the most clear possible terms, talking about uh, why we were where we were and where we were going and what the alternatives were and what they would mean, the different choices, the forks in the road. And uh, since that time, I have carefully watched Congressman Ron Paul, and he has been a a fount of uh, wisdom, of uh, restraint, a voice for limited uh, government, for the Constitution. He has voted only in favor of uh, measures that are uh, consistent with the requirements of the Constitution, and has voted against measures that are not not, uh, uh, prescribed, are are not uh, um, um, constitutional in, uh, in their effect. Congressman Ron Paul has offered himself up as a Republican candidate for president. He has formed an exploratory committee to that end. He is here in Arizona. We welcome him to our show. Congressman Paul, good of you to be here today. Thank you very much. Good to be with you. Um, So how are you going to pull this off? (laughs) With with your help, you're you're going to be my campaign manager. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) I demand a recount, too. (laughs) There you go. Well, I personally by myself can't pull it off. I'm, I'm really trying to find out whether there's enough people in this country who really believe in freedom and the Constitution. And to my surprise, there are more out there than I thought. So uh, there has been a change in the last 30 years since I've been involved in, in politics, and there are a lot more people who realize that the problems that we faced in the 1970s uh, was an isolated event, but it was just a preliminary to some of the problems that we still face. Because if you look at our budget, and the, uh, the entitlement system and the foreign policy, our conditions are actually a lot worse than they were in 79 and 80 when that precipitated interest rates at 21 percent and, and the many problems that we had with high unemployment rates. So um, the, the big question is, is uh, are there enough people out there that care and can I rally them? And uh, that's yet to be uh, seen. And uh, uh, it's difficult to raise enough money to really compete, but on the internet, I think we're able to reach a lot of people, and talk shows like this have been very, very helpful. Uh, Major media outlets uh, generally aren't going to be uh, available to us, but uh, we live in a different age right now, and and the Internet changes not only uh, yearly, but almost weekly on the new programs and and availability of uh, finding out where our supporters are. There really used to be two or three, four or five, uh, there were a couple, two or three television pipelines a couple of print journalism pipelines and everything flowed through them and if you didn't get heard or seen in those venues then you were you you weren't included but now i mean it's just i mean it's it's wide open i mean everybody can go to ron paul on uh, on the internet and find out what's going on with your campaign the kind of support if uh, the major news media isn't reporting the kind of greeting that you received for example at sky harbor airport last night just on one campaign stop I mean, I guarantee you the other presidential candidates aren't getting that kind of greeting. Yeah, and, and you know that, who knows, somebody might stick that on YouTube or something, and there will be, you know, t- tens of thousands, if not more, people will see this. And if you do that often enough, you know, the media generally is pretty lazy. So if, if there's something of significant that keeps popping up, uh, you know, on the Internet, you know, lo and behold, they may be influenced as well. Well, you, mean you, you can see now, if you don't agree with Carson Paul about anything else, you know he's dead on about the media anyway. <laughs> All right. 
Um, this is your opportunity to talk with the man that, uh, that I will be supporting for president. Our telephone number is 602-277-KFNX. It is 602-277-5369. We want to take as many of your calls as possible, let you get a chance to, uh, to talk to Congressman Paul and ask your specific questions. Um, there was a time that it was maybe an occasional newsletter writer or uh, uh, a talk show here, host here or there, or yourself talking about the, uh, the kind of the economic calamity that, 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 in my view, the Republicans and the Democrats have authored for this country. Now you've got, for example, the controller of the currency running around in a virtual state of alarm trying to awaken the American people. What's coming our way? Well... As I said before, I think it's a lot worse, although right now things look not all that bad, and a lot of people say, well, you've made predictions before and they haven't come true. I just wish fewer of my predictions would come true. I'd feel better about it. But I think the conditions are much worse, and as, as you mentioned, the Comptroller, uh, David Walker, has pointed out uh, the dire uh, things that are going to happen with our commitment on entitlements. Nobody can actually even measure it, but our entitlement system has probably committed future generations to like $60 trillion. And the national debt is a big problem, but that's minor compared to this entitlement uh, problem because we have to keep producing uh, to com make these commitments. Now, so far, we're able to limp along because we do still have uh, the status of uh, being able to issue the reserve currency of the world. Although it's not backed by gold, and although it is pure paper money, there's still a, a basic agreement around the world that you are, we will take your dollars, we will produce for you, and then we'll loan you all this money back again, which is actually a real good deal for us. And a lot of Americans complain about why we buy so much stuff from overseas, but it's actually a gift. And, but that gift is coming to an end, and the people are getting nervous about it because they said, well, the jobs are all, all overseas. Well, why have jobs here if people will work for us? And we print up the money and give it to them. Uh, but uh, they're starting to realize that the good, productive jobs and manufacturing has left the country. So there's much more disequilibrium in the system than there was in the, in the 70s and even in the 80s. So uh, what will happen eventually will the, the uh, foreigners we'll quit taking our dollars. and There will be another dollar crisis. So we will have to face up to this. Uh, we've lived beyond our means. I'm convinced we as a nation will have to live beneath our means, and it will not be uh, painless. It's going to affect everybody. Now, you, you heard on your way over here to the studio, I know uh, uh, my conversation with, uh, with Tom. One of the great ironies, by the way, is that when you left the House in 1984 originally, uh, the guy that took your place was, oh, my God, was Tom DeLay. That's right. Oh. That's <laughs> I told I, I said to somebody on the air the other day, he had some big shoes to fill, and he didn't fill them yeah. when, he, when he took your old seat. But uh, we had him on the show, and I asked him about, uh, about the war in Iraq. And uh, I said, why didn't you get a congressional declaration of war? You know, you swore to uphold the Constitution. It says, you know, Congress has to declare war. Will you walk us back through that period in 2002? Right. Matter, matter of fact, uh, my intense interest in that subject began in 1998, where even under the Clinton administration, there was a resolution passed in the House floor, which was called the Iraq Liberation Act, which established our policy as that of regime change. So it started early on. The plans had been laid for a long, long time. So I was never surprised that, uh, uh, you know, the first cabinet meeting under Bush, they bring up the subject of when, when we're going to attack Iraq. The very first subject after 9-11, even though Iraq had nothing to do with it, well, when are we going to hit Iraq? There was a plan. They wanted to get rid of it. They wanted to control the oil and various other reasons why they wanted to be in there. So I, I'm on the international relations, and, a, and the resolution came through that, that committee, uh, which would have been right before the election of uh, 2002 because it was a political stunt, uh, you know, try to embarrass people to show that they're weak on national defense and they're not willing to go after these vicious dictators. So when that resolution came up, I offered a substitute. I said, you know, I don't want to go to war. It doesn't make any sense to me, but if you're going to war, you ought to do it properly. And then people should get behind it. I said, so I'm substituting the resolution with a declaration of war. And of course, they mocked it. They made fun of it. You know, the chairman said, you know, that part of the Constitution is anachronistic. Wait a minute. Yeah. That, that part of the Constitution is anachronistic? Yes, that part on the Declaration of War, we don't use it anymore. It's anachronistic. And then Lantos.